the participants for All-Star Weekend are set, and it promises to be another magical experience. It's a tribute to the players, to the guys who, who uh, didn't mind me being the 13th guy. 13 is a lucky number for the Bulls, who find themselves chasing history. We're not getting complacent with our success. New Jersey's recent success has ripened the fans of the Big Apple. It was just a matter of time for that green apple to get red and start to win some. So get fired up. Hammered up in your face, mama. The NBA Today takes you coast to coast. KJ has it. He'll throw it up from backcourt. Oh, oh, my oh, brother. Next. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the NBA Today. I'm Mark Jones. Well, we've reached the midway point of the season and it continues to come into focus. We're going to check in with the skinny for the next 30 minutes. We tip it off this week with the most riveting story in basketball over the last three months. I'm talking, of course, about Magic Johnson. Magic finished second in the balloting among Western Conference guards for the All-Star Game. In an unprecedented move, the league will allow Magic to play by adding a 13th man to the roster. Magic's return to the hardwood could be an image forever etched in our minds because he quenches a basketball thirst like no one else can. And for that, all basketball fans should be appreciative, as appreciative as Magic is to play. It's hard to describe sometimes your true feeling, and, uh, and I just want to say thank you to all the fans who voted and uh, who wanted to see me one more time, in a sense. And uh, also as a tribute to the players, to the guys who, who uh, didn't mind me being the 13th guy. I didn't w never, and I told Commissioner Stern that uh, I never wanted to take a guy's place. I never wanted to, 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 to deprive a guy who has worked hard uh, his spot or anything. And if that was the case, then I wouldn't go and play. But since they've added me like a 13th man, and uh, that Tim Hardaway has said some wonderful things that he don't mind me starting, because it, it probably would have went to him. And uh, so I'm ready to go now. And I, I want to thank Coach Nelson and uh, David Stern, as well as uh, Tim Hartman and the rest of the guys. Going to be interesting to see if he's lost anything. Since Magic's HIV infection, we've all become more educated about the virus. It's only human to fear the unknown. But the cloud of ignorance seems to be lifting around NBA circles. NBA All-Stars had this to say about Magic's participation. The fans select the starters for the All-Star game, and I think he deserves to play if the fans selected him, and I'm not concerned about uh, contracting the virus or anything. I just feel so much respect and love and compassion for Magic, and not, you know, again, I just don't, I wouldn't even cross my mind. You know, I've seen him already, and just just wouldn't even cross my mind. It bothers me that, that I think you can be at risk. Uh, things can happen, even if it's uh, the possibilities are small, that things can happen, and that, that always concerns me. But uh, um, so far, nothing's come about, so I can't worry about it. Interesting to note here that some of Magic's teammates, A.C. Green and Byron Scott, have had mixed emotions about Magic playing in the All-Star game. Scott's saying, and I quote, on the one hand, he retired. On the other hand, he was voted in. If they vote Kareem in, should he play? To be honest with you, I don't think he should play, unquote. Now, barring something unforeseen, the Olympics will be Magic's last appearance with his NBA homeboys. Far from home, down under, there was growing concern about the safety of Magic playing in Barcelona. One Australian medical director even called for a basketball boycott, and officials expressed their sentiments regarding Magic, sentiments that left a very sour taste. It hasn't been documented that any anybody has contracted this through playing and uh, uh, and that was wrong for him to do that and say that but on the other hand I knew things like this would be coming we need a lot of advice that uh, about how safe it is I mean we're told it, it's pretty safe but uh, it is a contact sport and there is uh, blood on the floor, so to speak. We certainly would not be recommending a boycott. What we would say, if, I guess, is if a player had real concerns and was, and was very uh, disturbed about the potential, if he perceived it as such, of obtaining infection, well, that, uh, I guess, uh, he'd be permitted to withdraw from that match. I'm going to just go on, keep smiling, keep working, and I'll wait to that moment. I'm going to still play, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. 
Now, just in case you were wondering, there are 12 other guys on the Western Conference All-Star team. The voting, as always, had its fair share of surprises. At the guard spot, it's Drexler and Magic starting. Tim Hardaway would have started, but says it's fine that Magic plays. In the pivot, David Robinson made a late surge in the balloting to edge Dikembe Mutombo by 7,000 votes. At forward, it's Malone and Mullen getting the call. Backing up the Big Five will be for Don Nelson, guard Tim Hardaway, his second All-Star game, Hornacek, his first All-Star appearance, John Stockton, the league's assist leader. Olajuwon, his seventh All-Star game, Matumbo, the top rookie, scored 18.5 points a game. Marley, Otis Thorpe, both making their first appearance in this great pickup game. In the Eastern Conference, Michael Jordan racked up over one million votes. Jordan will start with Isaiah Thomas in the backcourt, Ewing in the middle, surrounded by Barkley and Bird at the forward spots. Coming off the bench for Phil Jackson, Reggie Lewis, first time in the All-Star game for him. Joe Dumars rallying after a slow start to the season. Mark Price of the Cavs back from knee surgery last year. That's nice to see. Brad Doherty having his best season ever. Dominique Wilkins playing in the All-Star game for the seventh time. Dennis Rodman, the league's leading rebounder and one of the best defenders in the league, also playing. And Scottie Pippen of the Bulls filling out the bench. You know, every year there's a few deserving players that could make a very good argument for not making the team, actually for making the team. Here's how we summed up our We Was Robbed list for 1992. In the West, Mitch Richmond with 22.9 points a game, Ricky Pierce and Kevin Johnson all with a good argument for making the Western Conference team. Over in the East, Reggie Miller at 21.6 points a game, Purvis Ellison 20 points and 12 rebounds a night. Michael Adams with an outstanding year in Washington. Got to question that one. And Robert Parrish, who had made the All-Star team nine of the last ten years. Well, it's official, as our NBA Today crystal ball predicted last week. George Carl is the new head coach of the Seattle Supersonics. Carl taking over on Thursday night against Portland. The Sonics losing that game, 113 to 109. Now, Carl says that he knows that he's under the gun to produce quick results. Well, his second game behind the bench was Saturday night against Utah. Seattle led the game by one, 15 seconds to play, and they throw it away. Look at this. 14 seconds left. Jeff Malone steal. Jeff Malone steal. Jeff score the layup. Nine seconds left. Payton, five seconds to the base left. Stockton falls down. Payton puts it up the middle. The Jazz win the game. It's over. The Jazz have won it. How about that one? Tough way to lose. Three weeks ago, we showed you the comeback attempt of Philadelphia's Jeff Rulin. Rulin rebounding from a five-year absence in the NBA because of a knee injury. His knee rebuilt now through a new surgical technique using scar tissue as cartilage. Well, Rulin was contributing by setting monster picks and averaging five points a game. But Friday against Minnesota... His comeback attempt was put on hold for four weeks. Ruland limped off the court after playing just three minutes in the first half. He suffered a partial tear of his right Achilles tendon. He'll be out for three to four weeks. It's the same Achilles tendon that was hit by a luggage cart at the airport in Boston. We're going to take a short trip around the league in just a minute. The Chicago Bulls are on a winning binge right now. And after this break, we'll check in with Michael and company flying high as... We reach the midway point of the NBA season, and they reach it on another tear. Stick around. The NBA Today is brought to you by IBM, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the computer that changed the world, the IBM PC. And by Ed Shaving Gel. For less irritation, you've got the edge. Well, the NBA Today archives flash back to 1972. The place, Los Angeles. The team, the Lakers. The players, Chamberlain, West, Goodrich, Hairston, and McMillan. The record, 33 wins in a row and an NBA best, 69 and 13. A record that has stood the test for 20 years. Chicago taking aim at that magical mark of 69 and 13. So far, the Bulls are two games behind the, the Lakers' pace at the midway point. But Chicago is still on track to break the record of 69 wins. If they stay on pace, they'll win 72 games. That is amazing. But the mere mention of the best mark ever makes Phil Jackson, coach of the Bulls, very nervous. The Bulls will have to stay healthy. But remember last season? Chicago lost the fewest man games to injuries. Their 36 wins so far this season is all the more impressive when you consider the fact that they had to do without Bill Cartwright, their starting center, for four weeks. Chicago's depth leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. Chamber. 
Rivers out to Marley and a steal by Jordan. He'll come down, get the easy hoop. The Chicago Bulls 108, Phoenix Suns 102. Morris Grant there defensively. Johnson on the drive, lost it. Michael's got it. It's a foot race. Gill's ahead of him, lays it up. He yes! And he fouled. The hoop. Yes! Gaddison on the foul. Oh, what a turnaround play we've had here. More than that, he's already got two technicals. Three seconds on the shot clock. Jordan has to put it up, and he hit it off the backboard. We're not getting complacent with our success. I think we we're still hungry. We step into every arena. We know what we're faced with. We know the crowd may not be in our favor, but we bond together as a unit, and we fight. We fight ourselves to a win. If not a win, we fight ourselves for an opportunity to win. Now, if the Bulls are to make a serious run at the record, they will have to get through a tough stretch of road games leading up to the All-Star break. San Antonio, Houston, Utah, Phoenix, and the Lakers on the road. That's a combined home winning percent of just under 700. The Lakers beat the Bulls, if you remember, earlier this season in Chicago. Well, Rod Thorne, the NBA's fine collector, is filling his pockets once more. On Tuesday, Washington's A.J. English was slapped with a $3,000 fine for elbowing Jeff Hornacek. And earlier in the week, in two separate incidents, players broke the law of the court, the one that says, no bumping the referees, please. Vernon Maxwell was docked 7500 bucks and suspended one game without pay for doing the bump with official Jack Nyes and throwing a piece of tape at the ref. Mad Max will miss Tuesday's game against Minnesota elsewhere. Nets assistant coach Tom Newell was fined 2000 and suspended one game without pay for doing the same dance with referee Steve Javey. Well, the rough stuff might be a product of some of the trash talking that goes on during the game. Unlike football, the NBA doesn't have a rule against baiting players, but sometimes they cross that fine line between saying in your face and uh, saying something else. This week, one of the best trash talkers in the game was front and center again, Chuck Person. Who else? They played some basketball Wednesday in Cleveland. Mark tried to make Chuck Person pay the price as tempers erupted. The Cavs won the game, but after the game, George McLeod followed up a fourth quarter scuffle with John Battle by punching Battle in the face on the way to the locker room. Battle grabbed a two by four to retaliate, but the scuffle was broken up. You know, it's time for us to stand up and be men. Stop, you know, letting people, you know, back us down, make it look soft. But that's how um, rep around the league. That we're a soft team, and personally, I don't think I'm a soft player, and I know Chuck's not a soft player. So you just gotta stand for what you believe in. Hopefully, we can get some more guys in the war force, night in and night out. If, if teams wanna, you know, uh, fight, we we'll fight. We're gonna play basketball. We'll play basketball. Friday's rematch saw only loose lips and not clenched fists like this encounter between Detlef Schrempf and Larry Nance. Battle was back in action, but McLeod missed the game after receiving a $10,000 fine and a one-game suspension. The Cavaliers again had all the right angles, winning the war by taking the battle on the court again. The Wolves are getting passed along like a second-hand suit. Opponents have rejected Minnesota eight straight times, and their defense is nowhere to be found. When opponents score over 100 points, the Wolves are 0 and 26. The Mavericks finally found the win column this week. Rookie Doug Smith scored a season high 26 points as Dallas ended an 11 game losing streak by bunking Milwaukee. Dallas hopes the win will begin a new streak. Sooner or later you got to get the monkey off your back and we got it off after 11 losses and it's positive. So now we're going to turn this thing around and try and win 11 straight just like we lost. Them. Remember October 1974? Gerald Ford in the Oval Office, Olivia Newton-John atop the pop charts, Godfather Part II packing the theaters, and the Sacramento Kings going by the label, the Kansas City Omaha Kings. It was also the last time the Kings won at the Forum. Friday, they had a chance, but Mitch Richmond misfired at the buzzer, as the Lakers dethroned the Kings for the 43rd straight time at the Forum. You can call him the Iron Rocket. Wednesday, Otis Thorpe played his 500th consecutive game. Thorpe's streak leads all active players, but still trails Randy Smith's all-time mark of 906 games. Finally, in New Jersey Friday, D.C. was okay 
and the Nets dialed 1-800-Coleman all night. Playlock off to Coleman, down the lane for the lefty jumper, good! Coleman back to the hoop, fakes, now fires the jumper and hits! Coleman baseline left, hits again! Oh my goodness, he is in all 11 of his shots! Coleman finished with 38 points as the Nets won their fifth straight game, their longest winning streak since 1985. 1-800-Coleman, nice number for the Nets. Still ahead on the NBA today, our Edge Player of the Week and Showtime. But coming up next, the New Jersey Nets are emerging from that quagmire of mediocrity. We'll show you how and why, so stick around. We'll Remember six weeks ago? Depending on which of the New Jersey Nets owners you listened to, Bill Fitch was either in or out as head coach of the Nets. Jim Valvano was reported to be on his way to Brendan Byrne Arena to take over, but... Uh, Something strange happened along the way. The Nets discovered a formula for winning with the same coach and the same cast of players. No one's laughing at the Nets anymore. They're just scratching their heads trying to figure out how they've become the biggest surprise of the NBA season. The Nets are jamming. The leading pass to Bowie and a jam. The Nets are jamming. Let's go Morris and the lefty jam. Somehow everything has fallen together so unexpectedly. Just two months ago, everyone was unhappy. The owners, or at least one of the seven, didn't like the coach. The coach didn't like his job, the players didn't like anyone, and the fans didn't care. But right around the time that the situation seemed totally helpless, this team started winning games, almost by chance. Will the person responsible for this offer report to my office? A look at the first quarter of the net season, and the second quarter shows an improvement that defies logic. Unless this is one team that couldn't get any better until it couldn't get any worse. Early in the year, there's been a circus atmosphere around here in regards to Bill's status. Uh, will he be coach? Will he not be coach? And when you look back on it, that was a distraction in the sense that really affected the performance of the team. The Nets draw just over 10,000 people a game in this 20,000-seat arena. So on most nights, you can get a choice seat, an unobstructed view of the court, and a personal servant of your very own. Here's your drink, Mr. Jones. Here you go. Keep the change. Thank you very much. But this could all come to an end because the Nets are serving up a new attitude, a new identity, and a newfound confidence and respect for their head coach. The biggest thing, he didn't stop coaching us. You know, he came through and he said, I'm here today. You know, I'm worrying about today. And came the next day, I'm here today. I'm worrying about the day. And I think uh, we take the same philosophy from what he has given us and the fact that, you know, we're going day by day. Bill Fitch has fought ownership, fought the players, and fought, but only somewhat, to keep his job. Truth is, if the Nets owners knew how to fire a coach, Fitch would be gone by now. But he's still here, and the players have responded positively to a chaotic situation. We as players just have gotten tired of losing, and we've rallied together. It wasn't a case of whether I could coach or not. I just wasn't getting along with, with one owner in particular, and, and uh, uh, he decided that he could find a coach that he could get along with, I guess. If it wasn't Fitch's survival instincts, it might have been his handling of high-priced rookie Kenny Anderson that won him some respect from veteran players. Fitch didn't want to draft him, and Anderson held out. Now he's sitting while the veterans play. The respect I have for him is he said what he felt. He didn't pull any punches. He might have uh, stepped on some people's toes at the time he was speaking his piece, but uh, he had to do what he had to do. I guess in the league, you don't have to love a coach to go out there and give them all, your, you know, all you got. There's a lot of diets I tell these guys I feel like a, a Hindu snake charmer with a deaf cobra. But this snake finally found a hearing aid. You could be jamming too. And they're hearing very well right now. Time to call a timeout. There's still a ton of fun to come, including showtime, so hang in there. We'll also hear more from Kenny Anderson of the New Jersey Nets on his rookie season. As we go to break, let's see who's hot. And staying with the New Jersey Nets, Derek Coleman, D.C., averaging 27.3 points a game over his last three outings. That is hotter than July. Stay tuned for information on the Baby Ruth NBA All-Star Game sweepstakes. Oh, 
Well, this week on our Rookie Watch, we check in with Kenny Anderson of the Nets. A number two first rounder usually means that you're getting an impact player, but so far that's been anything but true in Anderson's case. Anderson isn't getting a lot of minutes, and you can kind of tell that he's not too excited about it. People close to the Nets, though, still tell me that he's going to be a great player, including Willis Reed. I spoke with Anderson, and to his credit, he still has his confidence. Well, everybody's doing their own part, and I think the little time that I get, I have to go out there and put that effort in just like the other guys are doing, and I think it's really, you know, paying off on, on that end and, you know, staying up. If I'm not playing that much, stay up, give other players confidence and encouragement out there when they're on the floor. Now, Anderson isn't the first highly touted guard who's struggled in his rookie year. In fact, he has some pretty good company in the likes of Stockton, Drexler, Hornacek, and Harper, can't give up on him just yet. Well, from one Anderson to another Anderson, this week's Edge Player of the Week is Nick the Quick from the Orlando Magic, averaging 25.8 points a game, 9.3 rebounds a game, and registering his first career triple-double. He's our Edge Player of the Week. Well, the Magic, Nick's team, guns for their third straight win Tuesday night as they host Seattle. We're going to take it home in a second with our best move. You know which one it is. This one. Show them, Gerald. Showtime. The NBA Today is brought to you by IBM. Celebrating the 10th anniversary of the computer that changed the world, the IBM PC. And by Baby Ruth Candy Bars. Enter the Baby Ruth NBA All-Star Sweepstakes. And now from the files of The Unexplained, this one ranks right up there with other unsolved mysteries like the Bermuda Triangle, the Pyramids, and Chris Dudley making a foul shot last week. This one is every bit as difficult to comprehend, too. Tuesday in Chicago, the Suns in town to battle the Bulls. Kevin Johnson with the rebound and fires it up. Yes, you got it. Unbelievable. But you know what? That's not the best part of it because 30 minutes later, at a high school game in Michigan, just a few hundred miles away, guess what? A rebound, an 80-foot shot by a guy named Kevin Johnson. Yes, you got it. Unbelievable. Well, you can't beat that with a bat, and you can't beat Showtime either. So let's get with the program for me and the rest of the NBA Today posse. We'll see you next week. Long outlet mid court to Clyde. Yes. Oh, Jerome. Double pump, pounding down jam. Steal by Hardaway, and here's Mullen making the lead oh, in for Ellie. Oh, but Harper has done it many times tonight. Dark for Mason. Well, those are the super skills and moves of Ron Harper. Discarded by Augman. Ellie off the drive, and the dump inside to Hardaway. Jackson with a gorgeous feet to score. Look at that shot. There's one for the highlight tape. Marvelous court awareness by Dominique Wilkins. Handle that Elliott save, and Mullen was out of bounds. Watch this, Moonraker. 